welcome to this afternoon's Ali Spring Virtual Open House. Um, this is the third virtual one that we have done this year because of, of the pandemic. We are hoping that by fall, we will be able to be together again and have some great food. I hope you all have your little snacks and stuff beside you. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us. As I said we uh, earlier, just a couple points of business. We are recording this, so it will be available for you to um, watch again later. If you missed something, you can feel free to share it with friends and family. Um, and it will also it is also being live streamed to Facebook. Um, just some information for anybody who is watching us today who um, is not already an Ali member or um, hasn't been one in the recent past. I'll go through a little bit of information for you here. I, I'm sure that our instructors and members, current members will attest, we have a lot of great programming and, and always have a lot of fun. Um, our spring term runs actually runs uh, April 4th through June 25th. Most of our classes and events, though, are going to uh, take place between April 12th and May 27th. And we do have a pretty jam-packed schedule, offering over 50 opportunities this spring. OLLI classes are open to members only. Um, our annual membership is $30, and that runs July 1st through June 30th. Um, for that $30 annual membership, Member, member benefits include, and th these are offered to you as a member at no extra cost, um, weekly Ask a Geek session with our professional technologist, Michelle Klishis. She is a delightfully helpful person and will answer any and all of your technical questions. And if she doesn't know an answer, she will take the information down and search it out for you. We do those on Tuesday mornings. We also do virtual happy hours on Sunday evenings at 630. So if you want to come in and hear about our pets and dinner and gardening and sports and books that we're reading, um, anything and everything, it really is just a, a big fun uh, chat session, happy hour on Sunday evenings. Um, once a month, on a Tuesday night early in the month, we do trivia. We call it Twilight Trivia. This is not Twilight, the, the book series or movie series. It just refers to the fact that it's held um, at 7 p.m. So it's a little a little later in the day. Um, but it's usually about an hour to hour and a half. And it's also a lot of fun. We do that about once a month. Um, this term, we're offering a session on Zen doodling. Um, with a couple of students from WVU. Very excited about that. Um, explore your creative side. Uh, if you're not familiar with Zoom, um, for those of you, this might be your first time on, or if you're watching on Facebook Live, then um, we do offer Zoom training sessions as well for, um, for anyone. So if you haven't, if you need some practice on Zoom, um, just give us a call, send us an email, and we'll get you set up with Michelle Clicious to do a session learning how to uh, how to use Zoom. Um, another one, these are just a, a few that are available. We also have interest groups. Um, this this term, continuing this term, our yarn arts group and um, a, a secondary Tai Chi group that's open to members who have previously taken Tai Chi with us. Um, come summer and fall, we are looking to add possibly as many as 10 more interest groups. So those are those are always available to our our current members when you are um, without the extra fee. So uh, let's see. So uh, for a flat enrollment fee, a flat term enrollment fee of only $30, you can take as many OLLI classes as you wish during that term. So you pay your $30 when you, when you register at the beginning of spring term, and you could take three classes for that $30, or you could take 15 or 20 classes for that same $30. So as many classes as you can um, fit into your schedule and want to join us for. Are there any questions so far before I, one other thing before I delve into the instructors that um, unless the classes are held outdoors this spring, all of our classes will continue to be held on Zoom, online via Zoom. Um, at the moment, we are also planning to only offer classes online via Zoom 
through our summer term as well, unless the classes are held outdoors. And, um, but that may change depending on, on how the, um, the close of the, the pandemic, uh, wrapping up the pandemic, making it go away, depends on how that goes. So we will keep you all informed about that. Um, so we have a, a great selection of, of instructors with us here today. Um, and I will say we have great instructors across the board. Uh, the ones you will hear from today are ones who were able to be with us today. So um, not pointing them out specifically for any reason other than that they agreed to be with us today. All of our instructors are, are really great. Um, first up, um, oh, excuse me, went a bit too fast, is Rabbi Joe Blair with us. Rabbi Blair, if you're with us, go ahead and unmute yourself. I'm looking through the list here. Um, give him a second. I'm not hearing from Rabbi Blair, uh, Rabbi Blair right away. Okay, so in that case, we will go on to... Um, we'll come back to this if Rabbi Blair shows up. Just real quick, since you're seeing the screen, he's going to be offering two classes, Magic and Judaism, on Thursday, April 13th at 1130 a.m., and Jewish Short Stories for Discussion on Tuesdays, April 20th and 27th at 1130 a.m. Um, Rabbi Blair is out of our Charleston program. So let's see, who's up next? Ed Johnson. Ed, I know Ed is here. He's actually in the other classroom. And I am going to uh, turn his camera back on so that he can join us. Okay, Ed, you can turn your camera back on. I hear, I see you've unmuted yourself and go ahead and talk about your class. Your class. Hi there, hi everybody. Um, yeah, always a lot of fun. And I'm particularly this term going to do some kind of fun classes. Um, the Disney night pageants and spectaculars from all the dozen Disney parks around the world. Um, we're going to do five. I had scheduled nine. We're only going to do five this term and maybe do another four or five next term. Um, these are things that are not parades and they're at night. So they involve lights. They typically involve fireworks. They typically involved um, um, just, just a lot of great music and so forth. Uh, did some of these a um, couple of terms ago. The first one we'll do is the Illuminations, which was uh, playing when I was a, a cast member at Walt Disney World in the early 90s. Uh, gonna have a different video than we used before. Also going to do the Reflections of Earth version, which played for about 20 years until very recently. Uh, and then also gonna do a new one called Epcot Forever, which is uh, was cut short by the pandemic, uh, but but they did uh, perform it several times before. The other two um, for this term, since we're probably going to have a fairly small class, we may just let the uh, students decide what we want to do. It could be anything from the opening night ceremony at uh, to at um, Shanghai Disney. Uh, it could be the uh, Disney Dreams from uh, Europe, European Disney at Paris. Uh, it might be uh, something like, um, um, well, we'll just have to decide. And I think uh, probably my time's about up. So I, we want to have some other good people talk. And so uh, we'll talk later or you can send me questions. Thanks. Bye. Thank you, Ed. And as you can see on the screen here, um, Disney Night Pageants and Spectaculars is going to be on Thursdays from April 15th to May 13th from 1230 to 130. So let's see who we have up next here in my slides. Um, Kenton Colvin, the American muscle car. Is Kenton on here? Um, let's see, here he is. I'm here. Wonderful. What, do you need to share screen? Do you have anything to share or? No, I can just talk okay. just for a couple minutes. Okay, it's all yours. Okay, well, hello everyone. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, I'm going to teach another history class, and this history class is basically dealing with the American muscle car. Um, <clears throat> and I'm going to be dealing with, well, what is a muscle car? And actually, what started the love of these cars? Who started producing muscle cars? And who started producing them in mass production? What companies and why did they do that? 
what influence did this phenomenon have on American life and culture? Uh, just some of the topics that I'll be discussing is some of the songs that uh, became famous because of these muscle cars, car insurance, the types of advertising, the engineering, uh, the demise of the muscle car era, and then the rebirth of the muscle car era, which is actually going on strong today. Um, you hear the names like GTO and Roadrunner and 442. What does those names mean? And what how did they come about? Um, and I'm just going to be talking about the history of all of this. But I'm adding to that, it's a four week class. And the first week is going to be basically the muscle car era of the 60s and 70s is basically the when they got started. The second week, I'm going to be finishing that up with the 80s to the present. Then the third week, I'm going to get into the pony car history. A pony car gives its name from the Mustang. And so you have Mustangs and Challenge, Dodge Challengers and Chevy Camaros and that sort of thing. So that'll be what I'm devoting that particular lecture to. And then the last lecture, I'll be devoting it to the two-seater sports cars, such as the Corvette, the Thunderbird, and so forth. Uh, so I think you'll find a lot of different things uh, that may interest you, and it's uh, more than just the cars. Uh, we're going to be talking about the culture and the effects on uh, the life of uh, the people in America. So I hope some of you will join me, and uh, I'll be looking forward to teaching the class. Thank you. Thank you, Kenton. And again, that's the American Muscle Car. Um, my mother's looking forward to this one. I'm looking forward to this one as a big fan of muscle cars. It's going to be on Thursdays, April 15th through May 6th at 1230. And any questions for I, any of our instructors so far? Okay, let's go on to Jim Held is with us. Um, Jim is teaching two classes for us. Uh, actually, three classes for us this term. Um, Jim, you want to uh, welcome and you want to talk about your classes? Why, sure. Um, well, we're going to start out with History of the Movies Part 5, which will bring this topic up to um, the present. Uh, in reality, the, what the things we're going to be covering in this class could have classes all their own. Uh, we'll start out with eight or 10 to bring you, uh, you know, get you familiar with eight or 10 international directors of, of great renown. And then we'll enter into, you know, some of the things happening in the last 20 years. We, we, the, one of the biggest ones was that we, we stopped showing movies with actual film. And now if you go to the movies, you're seeing an all digital experience, which means that the theater has its own um, internet feed or whatever, and they, they simply download the, the movies they're going to show. And then what you see in the theater is replaying that download. Uh, but we also are going to be entering the world of Steven Spielberg, arguably the most uh, successful director in Hollywood history, definitely the most successful financially. Uh, George Lucas, likewise, his, uh, you know, the great uh, adventure sci-fi stuff that they've created and like that. So that's the movies. And then I'm going to do a, a one session thing. Let me see if I can hold this up um, on this little book, the Elizabethan world picture for any of you that might be uh, English majors or even history. The, the book was printed a whole long time ago, but it, it became sort of required reading for English majors, uh, historians and such because it explains the, the, the world order uh, during, you know, beginning in the Elizabethan era. So the uh, great chain of being, which goes at the top with God and down to the bottom, which is uh, rocks. And um, you also get the whole theory of the cosmos, uh, the microcosm, macrocosm, 
let's see, the, the humors, that's always a hot topic. And um, some of this, of course, is, is part of the, the Renaissance. So it'll be uh, very visual. There are all kinds of interesting things I'll be able to put up on the screen and we'll kind of explain what all that means, okay? So those are the two main ones and then I'll be uh, participating in the conversations on racism with Jay and, and Florida. And That's we're gonna all. talk about that one in a, uh, later this, this okay. afternoon, so. Cool. Thank you very much, Jim. And Jim's classes, The History of Movies, on Wednesdays, April 14th through May 5th at 1230. And Unpacking the Elizabeth, the Elizabethan World Picture on Wednesday, May 12th at 1230. So thank you. Um, let's... Well, will we need to purchase the book for the class for the Elizabethan World Picture? No. Okay. So that, there we go. Okay. So... Um, the next next up, we have uh, Rabbi Joseph Hample. Rabbi Joe, are you you're with us here, right? Um, yes, I am. I'm here. Yeah, here you are. Welcome. Thank you, Josina. So um, I'm the uh, I'm based at Tree of Life Congregation on South High Street in Morgantown. I've been here nine years. Uh, when I was in seminary in L.A., halfway through the program, they gave us sort of an honorary master's degree. It was just like a pat on the head, a meaningless step, really, on the road to ordination. I was at dinner with some of my classmates and a professor, and my classmates were saying, what nonsense, they give us this meaningless master's degree. And I said, no, I love it because, you see, my brother has a master's degree. Uh, so I was thrilled to receive a master's degree. I said, it's all about sibling rivalry. My professor said, I know, I've read Genesis. So um, uh, that started me thinking about the archetypes in the Bible are all about, you know, uh, uh, sibling rivalry, uh, dysfunctional families. Uh, you know, look at it, Cain and Abel, uh, Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau, uh, Joseph and his brothers. Those are uh, all sibling rivalries. Just in Genesis and Exodus, you have Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, a lot of manipulation and backbiting. You have rival wives, Leah and Rachel are both sisters and wives, uh, Sarah and Hagar, Hannah and Peninnah, uh, uh, those are rival wives. Uh, you have people defying their parents, right? Pharaoh's daughter, uh, Pharaoh has forbidden any, has uh, decreed that Hebrew babies must be killed. What does his daughter do but adopt a Hebrew baby, Moses, and raise him to uh, manhood, defying her father? Uh, of course, people uh, look how people treat their children. Abraham bound his son Isaac for the sacrifice. Um, uh, uh, oh, Jacob deceives his poor blind father Isaac, pretends to be the brother Esau. You have a, a ton of sibling rivalry and uh, uh, per, uh, bad parenting and, and uh, filial ingratitude in the Bible. Uh, uh, you have a lot of uh, terrible marriages in the Bible. When I was a prison chaplain at the tippy top of California on the Oregon border, I remember one of the inmates asked about Adam and Eve. The inmate said, Rabbi, were Adam and Eve real people? I said, we're all Adam and Eve. We are, you know, uh, Adam blames Eve and Eve blames the snake. There's your basic dysfunctional uh, uh, relationship. That's all of us. We love the Bible, not because it's about people a long time ago, but because it's about us. Uh, another inmate asked me, why does everybody in the Bible sin? Don't they get it? God always wins in the end. I said, everybody sins because, A, that way we see ourselves in the story, and B, if nobody sinned, there'd be no story. The, the Bible would be one page long. God created Adam and Eve, and they lived happily ever after, the end. There's only a story because of transgression. So in Judaism, once a year on Yom Kippur, we confess all our sins. We confess every sin from A to Z. Now, have I really committed every sin from A to Z? I'm sure I must have missed two or three. But we are all capable of every sin in our hearts. Uh, when I was a prison chaplain, I mean, I wouldn't have known how to commit the sins those guys committed. You know, I wouldn't know how to rob a bank. 
but none of this is any stranger to the selfishness, the cruelty uh, that uh, that uh, inheres in the decision to rob a bank. We are all capable of every sin, and that's why the Bible is such an amazing read. Well, that's what I will cover in six sessions, and I'll uh, publish a, a, a handout before each session with the appropriate biblical texts. Thank you. And this one, uh, Dysfunctional Families of the Old Testament on Thursday mornings, April 15th to June 20th. Now, if I remember right, um, this is an encore class. This is, uh, you've done this class before. I, I have done this class before, yeah. Okay, but we have a lot of, of new members and members from Charleston, or maybe you didn't get to take it the first time around. So so just a little bit of information. If you have to decide between a couple of classes or something, you'll have that information. So thank you so much. Um, okay, next up um, we have, let's see, Jack Hammersmith. I know Jack is with us. Um, I am. The, yes, there you are. Wonderful. And you can go okay. ahead and tell us about your class. Oh, you're muted. There you go. I'm sorry now I didn't steal Rabbi Joe's uh, part of his title and call this dysfunctional democracy because uh, the quirky presidential elections I'm going to talk about in my course certainly showed a, a certain dysfunction, I think. We heard a lot uh, recently about whether or not an election was fair and accurate. Uh, we certainly have had in the past many that would question that you would have questions about uh, in much more serious ways. I'm going to spend the first uh, of our three classes talking about the election of 1876. Uh, for one thing, it was perhaps the most traumatic. It was not resolved until a few days before uh, Hayes's inauguration. Talk about a transition time. I mean, uh, it was a good thing he didn't have much in mind to do. Uh, it was decided by a presidential commission that's not noted in the constitution or had any president or has ever been used again. And it had serious consequences because basically it ended uh, those efforts at reconstruction that uh, we backpedaled on and making it necessary for what's called the second reconstruction uh, in terms of race equality or race fairness, or at least attempts at that after World War II. But we're gonna spend most of session one on this election because it came in 1876. It was the centennial year. This was a big year. Uh, the 100 years, after the Declaration of Independence. Uh, Philadelphia had the first of the American World Fairs in 1876 in celebration of that fact. It drew 10 million people and successful affair. Uh, 1876 was notable for many other reasons, uh, for the Battle of Greasy Grass. Now, if you're Lakota, Jack, I think we're losing you. Is anybody else available? If you're not, you might have heard about a little bighorn or more popularly, uh, Custer's Last Stand. Jack is breaking up. That's what I thought. Jack, you have a, it's, you seem to be breaking up really bad. Um, maybe got a bad connection. Okay, I think we lost Jack, so we're going to go ahead and... Uh, maybe I should move to another location yeah. and... Okay. We'll check back in with you after after we go through everybody else if you want to go ahead and move somewhere else. Okay. Um, so, you know, that happens sometimes here. Um, so next, uh, so just as a quick reminder, quirky elections, 1876 and more with Jack Hammersmith. Jack's classes are always always great um it's on wednesdays april 21st through may 5th at 10 a.m so let's see what do we have on the agenda next um environmental issues series two kathy elkins um is leading this series kathy are you yes i'm here there you are can you hear me yes. all right um 
So we started the uh, some of these classes on environmental awareness last October, and I tried to cover everything in two hours, but everybody knows the issue of environmental awareness or environmental advocacy is so complex and deep. Um, I realized I needed to break the topics down into smaller chunks. Uh, so we could really give uh, attention to it. So uh, the series one is what we did last winter with four different classes. And then uh, series two, we're just doing two classes this time in the spring. Um, and I'm calling the series environmental awareness, but instead of uh, just giving you information to um, give to give you insight into it to the issues. I also think it's important to talk about how we can make behavior change addressing uh, our role in carbon footprint or creating uh, the mess that we have with the environment. And thank heavens, the presidential election turned out in the favor of the environment. Um, I think we're going to see some progress there under President Biden. Uh, the first class for the environmental awareness uh, series for the spring is going to be April 21, Wednesday afternoon from 3 to 5. And the topic is transitioning from coal jobs to green jobs. So I have been so lucky to find expert uh, presenters on, on all these topics that we're addressing. Ted Bettner, who was previously with uh, Reimagine Appalachia, uh, he will be presenting the information on uh, how the, this organization has analyzed the three states involved, Kentucky, Ohio, and West Virginia, and specifically the West Virginia analysis of what is the current status of jobs uh, in the coal industry and how we might transition uh, training those uh, miners and other um, extractive industry employees, uh, training them into the um, uh, the other kinds of energy, uh, which would be uh, renewable energies and uh, the network of support services for all of those things. Also, it's a change in mind for the miners as well as a change in mind uh, for um, people who run the businesses. But we're also talking about the need for policy change uh, at the local level and the state level for West Virginia. The West Virginia Center on Budget and Policy is a big sponsor of Reimagine Appalachia. So we know that there's a lot of analysis done on employment and um, and data that talks about finances and, and um, uh, employment numbers and especially unemployment too. And then the second class will be uh, break free from plastic. There's two, uh, two or three uh, environmental organizations that um, uh, sponsor this issue and their intent is to try to uh, influence you to go through the entire month of July without buying any single use plastic items. Uh, I took the challenge last summer with my family and I tell you it was a challenge but this year I hope to get you ready so that you might be committed to try plastic free July yourself. Thank you. Thank you Kathy. Um, yeah that sounds like something I want to try to do. Plastic, pla single plastic use free July. Okay. Um, thank you so much. Um, okay, next we have a new in, new instructor with us. Um, Lee, would you like to go ahead and, and join us here um, and introduce yourself? I want to make sure I'm say I say your last name correctly. So um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Welcome. Thank you very much. I don't know if you can see me. Uh, no, we're not seeing you. Can you, uh, let me, I, can you click on the ask there? We might get you, there we go. There we go. Thank you for having me. Um, I am new. I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, be amongst all of you. Um, this is very awesome. Uh, my course is titled Holocaust Survival and Immigration, Oral History and Genealogy. Um, I will be discussing my father's life as a Holocaust survivor. He was born in 1923 in Łódź, Poland, and he was 16 years old when the Nazis invaded and his city was converted into a ghetto. In the late 1970s, my father dictated his life story onto 10 cassette tapes. It was very detailed and very organized. I listened to the tapes in 2015, almost 20 years after my father had died. 
he requested that someone put his story into a book. I wrote that book to honor his wishes and to remember our family. My class will be in four parts. It will be pre-war, the ghetto and concentration camps, liberation, and coming to Pittsburgh. And I will also include it, uh, my findings from doing extensive work on a family tree. Melvin Goldman's story is fascinating. It's also relevant in today's world because of the hatred and upheaval we are experiencing. I very much look forward to discussing my father's journey and meeting new and interesting people along the way. And I hope you'll uh, all come and join me in May. Thank you so much. We actually, um, I sent you an email today. We've got quite a, a group of people who are interested in being in your class. So thank you. Um, I'm, I'm excited. excited. We're excited to have you with us. Um, it's Holocaust Survival and Immigration, Oral History and Genealogy on Tuesdays, May 20, or I'm sorry, May 4th through 25th from 1130 to 145 p.m. So thank you. Jay, uh, yes. Jay, some of us took got emails that we were waitlisted for that course. Uh, um, so, Lee, Lee and I are going to be discussing that, um, <laughs> and, okay. and we, you will. Um, I'll just actually I'll address that point for everybody on here right now because there are a few classes that filled up very quickly, and so if you got an email saying you were on a wait list. Um, you may be getting moved into the class within the next couple of days too. So be sure to check your registration and your, um, your receipts. And if you have a question, feel free to just drop me an email um, or give me a call and I'd be happy to check your registration as well, because we may have been able to get you into the class um, already. So we are doing the best we can to get everybody into um, to the Zoom classes. So um, it's one of the nice things about Zoom classes. Um, okay, next up is um, Samicha. I am sorry, I'm falling a little behind to here in, in asking people to turn their video on. Samicha Reddy is going to be joining us um, this spring for Scottish contributions to the modern world. Samicha, are you, are you available? Yeah, I am. Here I you am. are. Okay. Welcome. Go ahead. Would you like to tell us a little bit about your class? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I have been teaching uh, at Ali since 2011 and have been teaching on various subjects. So this time the topic is uh, Scottish contributions to the modern world. And the inspiration I got from reading a book. Um, I don't know whether you can see it or not. Uh, well, anyway, I'll hold it. Um, How the Scots Invented the Modern World, the title says, the true story of how Western Europe's poorest nation created our world and everything in it. The author is Arthur Herman. And in my childhood, I do have a little bit connection to Scotland, um, the school uh, in Calcutta, where I was raised, uh, was founded by a Scottish person whose name was Alexander Duff. The name of the school is Duff School. It's uh, more than 100 years old. And so that's my Scottish connection. I always had, uh, you know, respect uh, for Scottish uh, uh, people and uh, when uh, there was a saying the sun never sits in uh, in British Isles they actually it in, includes Scotland and um, so while researching uh, Scottish people's contribution I came across uh, many many fields and in my proposal I listed um, science engineering medicine literature education and so I'll go through um, what those inventions are and who are the people responsible uh, for these inventions. So I had fun preparing for this class. I uh, had a few slides, but since uh, I thought uh, I'll be able to say what I'm going to teach about. So I decided not to show those slides. It was, uh, I prepared just for two or three minutes, but anyway, I don't need to. 
And uh, I, uh, on the literature side, I'm very fond of uh, a mystery and cannot think of anybody, but Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, I have been reading Conan Doyle's and my latest was because of my granddaughter who is now 16, but since the age five or six, she forced me to read all the Harry Potters. <laughs> so, so that's a Scottish connection. So hope to see you. Thank on you. May 4th and May 11th. Yes, um, Tuesdays, May 4th and 11th from 1230 to 220. Um, Scottish contributions to the modern world. So um, that should definitely be something fun to learn and, and hear more about. Um, thank you. Okay, let's see. Next, next, I believe is, um, yes, I was hoping, I don't think Dr. Cole is with us today. So I will talk about this one. So um, we're going to be offering, I am going to be co-teaching a class on Star Trek and Shakespeare. And actually, this is a class that I've been wanting to do for a while. I am, a, a, for those of you who know me, I come from a theater background. So I've, I've always been a big Shakespeare fan. But I was also raised by a Trekkie and I love Star Trek as well. And in my years of watching Star Trek, I've noticed and picked up on a lot of Shakespeare influence um, throughout all of the series. Um, the Star Trek um, universe now, I think as they call it, is um, like six or eight different series and multiple movies. There's a Klingon version of Macbeth. Um, so we're going to do five weeks on Shakespeare's influence on the Star Trek world. And that's going to be on Wednesday afternoons, April 14th through May 12th from 3 to 4.30 in the, in the afternoon. Um, Dr. Cole is going to introduce Star Trek and talk about the original series and the original movies, the original cast series movies. And I'm going to do a little bit more on an introduction to Shakespeare and then talk about the subsequent series, The Next Generation, Picard, Voyager, Deep Space Nine, um, uh, discovery there's a new one starting sometime next month or something a new star trek series other worlds so i i will be handling most of the later stuff and dr cole's going to handle the early stuff and we hope you will join us for that um let's see i think i have a duplicate slide here so oh no nope. okay then we also are offering conversations on racism and anti-racism um, I'm going to be offering that along with Florida Montgomery and Jim Held. Again, this term, um, this is a repeat of what we did this winter term. I know there were some people on the wait list when we did it this winter term. So um, we're offering it again. And it is a six, possibly seven week um, book group discussion. We will be reading three books, um, Cast by Isabel Wilkin Wilkinson. Um, White Fragility by Robin D'Angelo, and How to Be an Anti-Racist by um, Dr. Kendi, Kendi uh, Ibram Kendi, Ibram X. Kendi. Um, and um, it, it's a really frank discussion about racism in America, um, uh, around the world, and um, what we can do about it. Um, and I know that, well, Jim is on here. He spoke a little earlier. I do believe that that Florida Montgomery is on here too, Dr. Montgomery. Is there anything you want to say um, before we move on from this? Um, either of I, you? You did a good job. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you. This actually, this is a member, um, a member benefit event. So um, if you don't, if you're not taking any other classes, you don't actually have to pay the term fee to be involved in this. Although there are limited spaces in this because, because it's a group discussion. So there, we are only taking 20 people. Um, there are still a few places left though. So if you're interested in joining us, just let us know. Um, next. Okay. Judy, Warner, let me, here we go. Um, not sure which video to give you access to. I'll just ask you to start both of them. Judy Warner is with us and she's going to be teaching um, two classes that she teaches on a very regular basis for us. More lap dulcimer and play the tin whistle. Um, Judy, are you there? 
Let's see. Um, hmm. Okay, well, you know what? I have some slides from Judy. So let me um, sh give you a little bit of information that I know she wanted to share. Um, let me stop this share and do this one. Um, Oh, the fun of multiple screens. Um, let's see here. Um, here we go. Hey, Jay. Yeah. Judy's, Judy's there, but she's muted. Now, in our class, okay. she had trouble hearing yeah, us. Yeah, she did. Okay. I just asked her to unmute, so we'll see if that okay. works. Okay. We had to hold I'm unmuted on. now. Okay, okay, there you go. okay wonderful. Okay. okay. Do you have my PowerPoint that I sent you? I do. Would you like me to go ahead and share it for you? Yes. Okay, I can do that. Here we go. Um, and okay, I can. Okay, the lap dulcimer class meets on Mondays. This has been an ongoing class. And it is designed for primarily those with some experience, though this last time we had somebody who was brand new and, and it worked out fine. My concern with people who are brand new is the problem of keeping your instrument tuned. And so that's the one reason why we have said um, that it's more for, um, and I can't advance. Oh, sorry. Yeah, just, yeah, just say next when you're ready to advance. Okay, I next. Advance. I will advance it for you. <laughs> right, there I forgot go. that I'm not dealing with this. <laughs> That's fine, there you go. <laughs> okay, this is what a, a lap dulcimer would look like. Uh, there are also hammered dulcimers, and we are not dealing with hammered dulcimers. We're dealing with lap dulcimers. This is a hands-on activity. You will be actively participating, actively playing the dulcimer. This is not learning about the dulcimer but learning to play it. Uh, we do have some dulcimers and they are currently stored at the Ali office. And so if you need to get a dulcimer in order to participate in the class, uh, you can get one, but you would need to call the office to make arrangements to get into the office. Next. Uh, some of the types of songs, and we use a variety of songs right now, we're doing Carter family songs and probably at the beginning of the spring turn, we'll carry over and do some more Carter family songs. We do sing along songs because I like people to be able to know the melodies. So in our own uh, unique way, we sing the songs and uh, one of the songs uh, might be This Land is Your Land, something familiar that you know the tune to so that when you go to play it, you'll know which direction to play in, whether it's right or wrong. Uh, oftentimes the tunes that are done on the dulcimer are the old time Appalachian fiddle tunes. And an example of that would be Little Liza Jane. And then oftentimes in the spring, we do West Virginia songs because the West Virginia birthday is coming up in June. And there are just lots and lots of really good West Virginia songs, one of which is one of our, here in West Virginia, we are unique. We have four different state songs, one of which is West Virginia Hills. And that's one that we often play. Um, next, I think there, okay. It, I, the other class that I teach is the tin whistle. These are both musical instruments that you are doing hands-on, actively participating with. The Tin Whistle class is Wednesday morning at 10 o'clock. We are doing uh, the Tin Whistle uh, that you would need to purchase. It needs to be in the key of D. And you can either go to Follies in Saberton, or there are some, at, again, at the Ollie office, but you would need to make arrangements uh, to get into the office to get a whistle. Next. And this, it's, it's tiny, it's a nice instrument to carry around because you can just toss it in your pocket, in your purse, in a satchel. Uh, these are tiny instruments. Uh, they are made of metal so that they're not, you, you can drop it, it doesn't break. Uh, there are no moving parts. 
so there is nothing breakable. So it is, again, a relatively easy instrument to learn. Uh, with the dulcimer, we learn it by uh, the numbers. We actually put numbers on the dulcimer and numbers on the music so that you don't need to know how to read music. With the tin whistle, I do it by playing by letters. And we learn which of those holes is which uh, letter. And so you don't need to know music, read notes on a staff in order to play either of these instruments. Next. Some of, of the reasons for this class, it's designed, this Wednesday class is designed for the very beginner, somebody who has never played the tin whistle before, or somebody who has played but has really not developed the speed of playing or has a large repertoire of playing. In the class, we'll learn the fingering of the notes. Uh, it is a woodwind type instrument so that it involves breath control. And then there's something that we call tonguing and slurring, and we'll learn the difference between that and how to do it. And just in playing, we develop a whole repertoire, a lot of Irish music, Scottish music, uh, but we can play just any kind of American folk songs uh, on a tin whistle. We just expect to hear the Irish or the Scottish uh, music and, and enjoy that and learn some of the history that goes along with some of these songs. Next. Is there one more? Yeah. Some of the Celtic, and you usually use the word Celtic when we're combining Irish and Scottish. Some of the ones that we have been doing, My Bonnie Lies Over the Ocean, uh, we've done Amazing Grace, uh, Farewell to Tarwathi, which is a uh, going off on a whaling trip, uh, Kesh Jig, which is one of the it's supposed to be the most popular of the Irish dance tunes. So we try and learn some of the uh, more noted in, uh, songs that are associated with the Irish or Scottish traditions. And I think that should be it. So if anybody has any questions, I will just mention the Tin Whistle class on Wednesday is for the beginner and the advanced beginner. We do have a small advanced group so that if you are somebody who has played the tin whistle, uh, this is not done through Ollie, uh, but it's just some, a group of us that get together. And so if there's somebody that wants to play in a tin whistle group and has known how to do it and has developed a repertoire of songs, if you want to contact me and I can give you the information uh, as to when they are meeting and uh, whether it would be appropriate for you. I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, Judy, we do have one question in chat for you. Um, can people sign up for the class to observe, but if they're not ready to participate? Do you- I guess they could. I don't know why they would want to. Uh, usually I, when people come to observe, uh, particularly when we were meeting in person, I would always hand them a dulcimer mm -hmm. or a tin whistle and get them doing it. I think they would find uh, it is easy enough to jump into it right away. Uh, you know, I wouldn't mind people observing. Uh, so I guess I would say yes, but I would think that it would be more valuable to them uh, to, to try and participate. They would get more yeah. out of it. Okay. But I don't mind. Okay. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Ms. Seneca, can you hear me? This is Barbara Smith. Yes. Yes. I have a question. Sure. Um, uh, I'm a guitarist. I have an, uh, a dulcimer here that someone gave me years ago, and I've always intended to learn to play it, but I haven't. Um, so I was just wondering if uh, I could get in on this class. Um, never having played it before? Certainly. The, dulcim the dulcimer, that is. Yeah. The dulcimer, right. Uh, that would be the Monday class. And we have, uh, that is designed for beginners. Uh, uh -huh. There are many people in that group that take it term after term so that there are people within that group that are not strictly beginners. 
Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, you know, every term we always have somebody in the group that is a, you know, what I would call a beginner beginner. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know the one question that we have a hard time when I'm not in contact with the person is, do you know how the strings on the dulcimer are tuned? Not, I, I have a set of new strings that I've had forever also, but I haven't uh, had those out for a long time. And uh, I don't know how they're tuned, but I play the piano, I play the guitar so I can, uh, I can tune those up. I, I have a okay. tuner on my guitar, so. Right. It, uh, we, it, we use a different tuning. Are you here in Morgantown or in Charleston? I'm in Charleston. Okay, because I know here in Morgantown, if you go to the music store, they will tune it for you. They will also replace the strings for you. I don't know of a music store. Uh, Jake Crack used to have a music store. I don't know if he's still in business. We I'm will, not sure either. We will yeah. get the two of you together. <laughs> to work okay because <laughs> if, 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 if you um, if you get me her email i will i will do that and um, we will I, deal with it by email but i would love to have her in the class wonderful yeah just and just for, let me know how you tune it and uh, i can yes. i can take care of all that for okay. anybody in the charleston area um, who is interested in either of these classes, please contact me. And we do have some information about how you can possibly get some instruments in the Charleston area as well. So um, thank you, Judy, for, for that. Um, okay, so um, it looks like um, Rabbi Joe Blair was able to join us. So Rabbi Blair, would you like to talk a little bit about the two classes that you're going to offer this spring? I'd be delighted. The, uh, the first one will be April 13th. It's a single session and I've titled it or termed it as magic in Judaism. The issue is of course that in Judaism there is a prohibition on pr uh, practicing magic, but there is still a very strong tradition and, and belief in magic and in the efficacy of it that still runs through the religious texts and I'm just saying that we'll look a little bit at the text, starting with the Bible and going forward into the Talmud, the, the rabbinic texts that go forward and, and beyond, and see what they have to say about it. So that should be a, an interesting discussion about what's out there, what's permitted, what's not permitted, where it comes up, how it's used, when it's thought of as harmless, when it's thought of as being damaging, and so on. Um, the other class is uh, Jewish sh short stories. And what I've done is I've picked three stories to talk about in two sessions. The first session, we'll talk about uh, the two shorter stories, one by um, Ayel Peretz, which is called Three Gifts, and the second one by Sholem Alechem, which is called The Search. They are essential, fabulous reading. They're great stories in general, but they're also somehow, they. The best way to say it is there is something about them that even if you are not Jewish, feels somehow Jewish. And I would like to explore a little bit of what makes them have that feel and why that differs from other types of, of writers and, uh, and look at that in particular. And then the, the third story, the one we'll talk about on the 27th of April, will be an excerpt from uh, also Shalom Aleichem, but this is from his collected stories, Tevye the Milkman stories, the Dairyman, um, which wind up becoming the basis for the film Fiddler on the Roof. What I've selected is the story Chava, which is both uh, emotionally laden and also incredibly evocative. And so I think it would be something that's worthy and, and will be a rich conversation starter. So I'm hoping that you'll join me for that and at least dip your toe into this whole large sea of literature. Thank you. Those both sound wonderful. Um, I do know that um, for Jewish short stories for discussion, those titles were not yet available when the catalog went to print. However, I do believe they're on they're in the online version of our catalog, and they will be emailed to everybody in advance of the start of the class. The, the, the titles only other thing, Jacinda, that I would say is 
what I was able to find was actually tellings of those stories okay. by several people. So what I sent was um, YouTube videos of the, the tellings. Gotcha. So, so they'll at least have the titles and, and authors and maybe the, the YouTube tellings if they want to listen to them in advance. So again, that's Magic and Judaism on Tuesday, April 13th at 1130 a.m. And Jewish Short Stories for Discussion on Tuesdays, April 20th and 27th at 1130 a.m. Thank you so much. I'm glad you were able to join us this afternoon after all. So um, it looks like we have... Um, we still have a little bit of time and we have a couple of um, mem instructors who are with us that I was not aware was going to be with us. So I wonder if you would like to speak about your class at all. Um, Patsy Ann, and I'm sorry, I don't want to attempt to say your last name because I'm sure I will mess it up. If you would like to join us and talk about your class downsizing and decluttering. Hi there. Let's Hi, see. welcome. I will. Uh, there we go. I've put the spotlight on you, so you could just want to tell us about your class. Sure. Oh gosh, there's my hair. Yeah. Hi, everybody. My class is on April fourteenth, and it's called Downsizing and Decluttering: Right Size Your Life Size. So. I doubt that any of you have clutter, so you probably wouldn't be interested in this class. But if there's a few of you that might be, please join in. I am a professional senior move manager, which means I help older adults who are in transition and either moving out of their homes to a one or two bedroom apartment or something more manageable and to simplify their lives or they might be aging in place and need their homes to be less cluttered and function a little more uh, simply and safely, but still give them independence. And I also help do organizing and um, I have an association with an online auction company. So while I am not an auctioneer, I can give a little bit of advice on Maybe you could sell this, maybe you could sell that, maybe you should go ahead and donate that, etc. So that is my little unprepared intro, but I'd love to have everyone. That's wonderful. Thank you. And if anybody, another question um, similar to what Joanne asked earlier, um, I actually, Patsy Ann and I spoke this morning or earlier this morning, this afternoon, and we are increasing the class size. So for those of you who are currently on the wait list, watch your email to see that you have been registered for it because we are going to, um, to uh, add you to the class. So thank you. And let me just say that I will not, I do not judge. <laughs> you can say, you can ask questions about your clutter or or your situation and you can ask for a friend. <laughs> I don't care. Sure. I mean, I don't judge at all. So bring it all, just we'll figure it out together. I'm happy to guide you. Wonderful, thank you. Sure. Okay, and now we actually, we have Barry Wendell with us this afternoon as well. And Barry's going to, Barry is offering um, the great hits and albums of 1970. So um, Barry, if you would like to, so, um, did I unmute? Yeah, so what yes. I'd like to say first is, um, Patsy Ann, I feel your pain about the hair. And um, if you could see in the back, the clutter on my couch there. Um, if I have time, I would like to uh, make an attempt to declutter. But um, so yes, we have been through, amazingly enough, all of the pop music of the 1960s, plus classes on the Beach Boys, the British Invasion, um, the Brill Building, Motown, uh, I've done it all. So now it's 1970 or it will be in this class. And there's some new people that we're gonna meet. Um, James Taylor, uh, Joni Mitchell, the Jackson Five, for instance, Carpenters are gonna be new to us in 1970. Some groups we've heard from before, Crosby, Stills and Nash, um, Chicago, some refugees from groups that have broken up, Eric Clapton going solo, John Lennon going solo, Paul McCartney going solo, uh, of 
soul music from Brooke, Brooke Benton, James Brown, Aretha Franklin, The Temptations, country music from Charlie Pride, Glenn Campbell, um, Johnny Cash, uh, jazz from Eddie Harris and um, Les McCann, uh, hard rock and psychedelic from Quicksilver Messenger Service, King Crimson and Moody Blues. Uh, one thing I changed with the 1969 class, earlier I had done top 40 music and now I have switched to top 40 albums. And some people weren't happy about that because it's not the, necessarily the pretty tunes, uh, it's longer cuts and um, some of the stuff is kind of hard rock, which some people don't like. Um, we are gonna hear from Bread. Someone had requested back when I was doing the early 60s. Can we get to the point where we're talking about the group Bread? Yes, 1970, um, we will do that. Um, so that's it, it's um, music videos and um, some of it's just the picture of the album. Some of it is live videos, my extensive commentaries that I come up with, but uh, because there's so much stuff, I'm gonna try to keep the commentaries short. So that's it, six weeks, and I don't remember when, but Dimitri, um, Our, Christina can tell you exactly when. Absolutely, I am happy to share that with everybody. Thank you, Barry, for sharing. Barry is doing the great hits and albums of 1970. It's gonna be on Friday mornings, April 16th, through um, May 21st, 10 a.m. And I will tell you, this is one that we do not um, record. Okay. So if um, you're interested, but you're not gonna be able to make each one of them or something, go ahead and sign up because he does share great playlists, YouTube playlists. He puts them together in a, in a YouTube playlist and we email that out to everybody so you can hear them and listen to them subsequently. So um, be sure to get on that list even if you can't attend every, every one of the classes. I just wanna say that some of the last classes, the videos are there on YouTube. Um, yes. In the Brill Building, the great hits and albums of 1969, the great hits of 68, um, a lot of those are on YouTube. They're on my channel, but if you just put the title in of the thing, you can find them. My bet favorite is Music from the Brill Building Week 4. That's my favorite um, playlist. I'll have to go back and check that one out. So yeah, and if anybody, you know, if, if you can't remember, you know, how, how Barry said to find them, just drop me an email and I will look up the, the playlist for you and email it to you as well. So um, that's always a lot of fun. And, and um, we usually ask people to turn your cameras off during the class because there's so many people in the class and it takes up bandwidth. But also that means that, you know, anybody else can join me in dancing at our desks or wherever you're at and you don't have, not everybody has to see it. So, um, or singing along with the videos as well. So those are always a great way to start your Friday mornings. So well, we would like to see you dance. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I don't know, maybe when we're back live, you know, face to face, you can sneak, like, I usually sneak in at the back of the classroom sometimes and dance a little bit, but um, we'll see. So um, are there any other instructors with us today that I missed? Um, I think- Did we find Jack Hammersmith again? Um, yeah, yes, absolutely. Jack, you are still, let's see, I just, just saw him on the list here. Oh. I'm still here. Yes, Can you hear here. me now? That is better. Yes. Is the audio better now? The audio is better now. Yes. If okay. you would like to talk about your class again. Well, let me not repeat everything I said before, except to say that the first of the three sessions mm -hmm. will feature the election of 1876, which because of its drama, because of the unconventional way in which it was resolved, because of the implications, the ramifications afterwards with the end of Reconstruction, uh, it's particularly important, but also because it's 1876 and I do want to uh, talk about the context. Uh, that's why I'm taking more time with this one. It was a very important year. And uh, as I say, the centennial year, uh, the centennial state came in that year. And if you've forgotten and haven't been on Jeopardy lately and, uh, are looking for that uh, final Jeopardy answer. Uh, the Centennial State is the one tragically in the news so much today, which is Colorado. Mm. But at any rate, the other two sessions 
we will feature some other elections, all of which had a certain uniqueness to them. 1800, uh, when electors couldn't decide, now is Jefferson the president or Aaron Burr? Or which one's the president, which one's the vice president? It had to go to the House of Representatives in a very dramatic twist, only the third presidential election we'd had. And then in 19, 18, I'm sorry, 1824, it went to the House again in a very unusual election in which Andrew Jackson won the popular vote, Andrew Jackson won the electoral vote, Andrew Jackson didn't become president. Uh, so we'll explore the, the oddities of that. Four years later, based upon his cry of corrupt election, he did win, of course, and had eight years in the presidency. Then we'll look at uh, really an overlooked election, the election of 1888, which nobody ever talks about, unless maybe you are a relative of Grover Cleveland. We talk about Grover Cleveland because he's the only president who won and lost and won again. Uh, and that's driven presidential historians and others crazy. Do you count him once or do you count him twice? And what does that do to the total count of, of presidents? But uh, in truth, he won that in-between election if you think that the popular vote is of any importance because he won the popular vote three times in a row, but in 1888, he did not win the electoral vote. Of course, we know that's happened at other times. It happened in 2000, an election we all lived through when the Supreme Court decided who the victor was going to be. It happened in a less complicated way in 2016 when Hillary Clinton came up with 3 million more votes, but was short in the Electoral College. So we'll discuss all of these things uh, in the three weeks that we have together. Uh, I'm looking forward to it uh, and uh, I hope to see a lot of you there. Thank you very much. And I apologize for whatever the uh, uh, aberrations of my audio were here this afternoon. No worries. Thank you, Jack, for sharing with us. Um, we're all well aware of some of the limitations of internet service sometimes. So thank you for for being with us and, and sharing that. Okay, so um, we do have um, a brief video um, uh, for Melora Can's um, uh, four art classes that she is... Um, or I'm sorry, three art classes that she is going to be um, teaching for us this term. She was not able to be with us today, but she did produce this short video. So let me just share this with all of you. Um, I need to go to, oh, the joys of multiple screen. Here we go. Um, share with sound. Okay, if somebody, I'm going to start this, and if somebody would let me know if it's actually playing, that would be wonderful. I'm an Ollie instructor, and I am planning on presenting three art history classes for the spring term 2021 via Zoom. Unfortunately, I'm unable to attend the open house, so I have prepared a short five slide presentation here to give you some hint of what my classes might be like and perhaps tempt you. And this opening slide refers to all three of the classes, one of which has only one session, that's Verona Romana, one of which has two sessions, Florence and Istanbul and Venice, uh, Venice and Istanbul in the second session. And the third having three sections uh, on Byzantine, early Roman Byzantine and late Byzantine mosaics in the city of Ravenna, Italy. So first we'll start with the one in Verona. If you'd like to try that, it's a single session class. It's listed as 1230 to 230. I do not anticipate it taking all that time. It's rather short but that would leave it to opportunity for questions. And I suspect many of you may have already visited Verona or at least been in Northern Italy. Verona is very close to Venice and close to where I lived for 25 years when I lived overseas in Italy. 
I lived in Vicenza, which is about halfway between Verona and um, Venice. And what you see here are all Roman age mosaics from Verona or the Verona area. And the one on the right is really exciting. This is the floor of a Roman villa. And what you see here is the dirt because it's being dug out right now. It was discovered in 2020 by an, by an archeology span team. And I'm going to include some information on that in the presentation plus some links. So if you'd like to read more yourself, you could. But just looking at this, how gorgeous is that? To scrape away the earth in a field and come upon mosaic tile flooring that looks like that. Incredible. And Verona is a very ancient city. It was founded by the Romans around the time of Julius Caesar. It has a Roman uh, theater and an amphitheater is one of the largest ones in the world, smaller than the one in Rome, but not a lot, and is still used actively for opera performances in the summers. And I've attended opera there, and it's just an incredible experience to sit in an open air amphitheater, such as the Verona uh, Arena and view an opera. Our second class, which is called um, Inferno by uh, Dan Brown Thriller with a tour of art history sites related to it. It was what, if any of you read Dan Brown books, you've probably read um, The Da Vinci Code or perhaps seen the movie, The Da Vinci Code. Uh, the Inferno, another of his books has also been made into a movie they both star Tom Hanks, so it's fairly uh, high scale, beautiful movies, but they do take the plot and shift it to make it more theatrically appropriate for this big screen. And that means the ending of the Inferno is different in the book and in the movie. Similar, but different. At any rate, uh, it's based on um, Dante's Divine Comedy, the section dealing with the Inferno, and hence the name that Dan Brown applied to it. When I read this book for the first time, I had already read several of his others, and I was not all that excited at first until I began to realize where he was placing the characters in the story. He starts it in Florence, Italy, where I have studied and I've conducted um, traveling classes and where uh, I visited innumerable times over the years since I lived in Italy and was able to drive down at will. And from there, it goes to Venice, Italy, where, which was in my backyard and which was an intriguing spot for me. I loved it there. And from there, it makes a leap that you might not expect over to Istanbul, Turkey. Now, I cannot claim to be a world traveler. Once I put my roots down in Northern Italy, I traveled where I could drive or where I could take a train. Very few excursions beyond that. So my radius was fairly small with one exception. I spent one week in Istanbul for a job related conference. And while I was there, I visited the big mosque, which is called the Hagia Sophia and was originally built, built as a Christian basilica, Greek cross form, and is one of the largest churches in the world and now mosques. It's been through a lot of history. It was built in the 500s, so it's, over 1500 years old and it's an incredible experience and the ending of the story ends underground in Istanbul at another location that I actually also visited so by the time I closed that book it was like a thrilling reliving of the, my experiences in art while I was over there. I decided to make an Ali class based on that. 
So this class, while it reflects a little bit of the plot of the book, basically is an art tour that hinges on the movements the characters take through these different locations and some of the fine art that's available for you to see in those locations and some of the incredible art and architecture from various periods in history that's available there. So this is in two parts. Part one takes place in Florence and part two takes place basically in Venice and in Istanbul, which at the time of the art historical sites was called Constantinople. And I still think of it that way today. Following that, my third class, which goes starts the following week at, let me go back for a minute. The um, Inferno class is April 26th and May 3rd, midday on Zoom. So then the following week, I begin a three-part session on mosaics of Ravenna. This is a close-up of a mosaic from Ravenna, and it happens to be the face of the Emperor Justinian, who was an Eastern Roman Empire emperor from Constantinople in the 500s, uh, not too long after Constantine himself. And Justinian built some of the underground locations that we actually go to in the other class, the one on the Inferno. And he commissioned the Hagia Sophia also, I believe, I'll have to recheck that. But at any rate, here he is. He is going to be in one of the three classes on Ravenna mosaics because it celebrates him and his wife, Theodora the Empress. And so you will have an opportunity to meet them in the second, I believe, of the three classes. The first one will deal with early Christian art from Gala Placidia's mausoleum and a couple of other um, architectural sites in Ravenna and near it. And then the second week will deal with Byzantine, high Byzantine art, which includes uh, the mosaics of Justinian and Theodora, and the third week will be late Byzantine mosaics from uh, some of the other buildings in Ravenna, which was a uh, fabulous place for Byzantine art during the period that we'll be examining. This, these classes, the three segments for this class run May 10, 17, and 24 midday. So I hope you can make it, whether you see all these classes or only visit for some of them. Normally, the art history classes are recorded, so you should be able to see them at your leisure rather than at the scheduled times should you choose. So I hope to see you then, and I hope to have a chance to chat with you. Thanks so much. Okay, and those are those are Melora Kahn's classes. Um, we have two more people with us, and and then um, and then we will wrap up. So Deborah Layton is now with us. Deborah is teaching um, yoga for anxiety this term, anxiety and insomnia this term, as well as um, native plants for difficult landscapes. So. Um, welcome, Deborah. Um, if you want to unmute your site, are you still muted? I, no, you're good. Hi. Um, so yeah, I'm teaching two very different classes this term. Um, one has to do with uh, my former life. Um, I am teaching a class on native plants, and we'll be looking at three different kinds of difficult to plant sites wet areas, shady areas, and steep slopes. So those will be the areas that we're uh, focusing on and native plants that help with those kinds of landscapes. And then the yoga class I'm teaching this term will be yoga for anxiety and insomnia. So it will include some uh, asana, some of the postures, because movement helps us to um, move all of our joints and kind of relax the body and um, 
a certain kind of way. And then we'll be focusing more on meditative techniques to help calm the nervous system and bring us into a state where we can feel less anxious and um, be able to go to sleep at night. So um, hopefully amongst those things I'll be teaching about yoga, there will be some tools that you can take with you and do little mini practices um, as you need them, either when you're feeling anxious or when you're um, getting ready to go to bed at night. So that's the gist of that class. So if there are any questions about that, I'm happy to answer. Well, thank you. I'll just let everybody know yoga for anxiety insomnia is going to be on Tuesday afternoons, April 13th through May 25th at three o'clock. And then the, um, the native plants for difficult landscapes is on Friday, April 23rd at 10 a.m. So thank you so much. Um, Deborah, I'm glad you were able to, to join us. Um, and Next, um, Michelle was able to join us. So Michelle, you want to talk about your, um, your hiking classes a little bit? I mean, you could talk about your technology classes, but I think it'd be more fun to hear about your hiking classes. I can do that. Um, for the past uh, year or so, I've been teaching, I've been te not really teaching, I've been talking about the various West, uh, places in West Virginia to hike. And uh, this term that just ended, I talked about some of our state parks that have lakes and rivers. And, and that's actually available if y'all are super bored. The recording for that is available. So you can just send an email to the OLLI office for that. Um, this coming term, I'm going to be talking more about forests as well as some of the historical areas we have in the state. Um, like uh, the two, we have two state parks like Droop Mountain and I told you I was going to forget everything. Uh, Droop Mountain and that other one, Carnifex Ferry, that are Civil War battle sites. So all of these things are, and you know, I'm going to talk about all these different things as well as where to hike or where I like to hike um, and some of the interesting things about that. Also, I will be leading hikes one in Morgantown and one in Charleston. Uh, the Morgantown one, we theoretically have a rain date for. So if it rains on that day, uh, it'll be held the following Saturday. Charleston, I'm not sure, but uh, sorry. Morgantown is going to be on the Sunday. Charleston is gonna be on the Saturday. Charleston, I haven't cleared it with my husband as to whether we will actually have a rain date for that one or not. So what'll happen is if you sign up for those classes, I'm gonna send out um, an email once the term gets started and we'll discuss various trails. I have gotten a couple recommendations for Charleston. Um, so I'll want all your all's input as to what you think the good trails to hike are. And I think that's enough. Okay, thank you. Um, so we'll, just to reiterate, um, the West Virginia State Parks Forest and Historical um, areas. That's on Tuesday, May 11th at 10 a.m. And then the hikes for, for the Morgantown area. And, you know, if anybody in the Charleston area wants to drive up and do this with us, feel free. And I, I'm going to say us because I'm going to come with Michelle and you guys on these two. Um, I'm looking forward to them as well. A, the, the Morgantown area one will be going to Cooper's Rock State Forest on Sunday, May 16th, um, starting at around noon. And then the Charleston area one will be going to the Kanawha State Forest State Park. Sorry, I don't have that catalog in front of me. And that one's on Saturday, May 22nd, I believe. Um, and like Michelle said, we will look at, at rain dates um, for those if, if the weather's not good. So um, so this, this is the point, you know, we've still got just a couple minutes. If anybody has any questions, I'm going to go ahead and end the Facebook Live. But if anybody would like to um, ask a question, chat with us, feel free to, to, oh, Earl is here. Earl, would you like to say a few words about your class? I'm sorry, I didn't realize you were with us. Uh, yes, I unmuted myself. Oh. My class is uh, Great Scientists. And uh, and uh, I uh, 
want to give everybody an appreciation for science and also the scientists that have uh, changed our, our world. And when everybody thinks about scientists, they probably think about physicists and chemists, but it's much more than that. Uh, for example, the person that developed the interocular lens to treat for uh, for uh, uh, cataracts. cataracts and uh, uh, also a lot of the uh, scientists that developed the uh, computer age, uh, such as like Claude Shannon, who is uh, who ba basically invented the information age, and we are living in the information age right now. So uh, that's about it in a nutshell. I hope uh, uh, some of you are interested in it and uh, hope to see you there. Okay, let me, um, let me see. We'll let everybody know when Great Scientists is. Let me find it in the catalog. Here we go. Great Scientists with Earl Melby. That's going to be on Tuesdays, April 20th and 27th at 1230. So um, thank you. Thank you again. I'm going to go ahead and say goodbye to everybody on Facebook Live. Thank you for joining us.